if everyone loves you, then you're probably not pushing it enough or you're not really pushing boundaries or being a little bit controversial enough. I think that's like the important thing for like a lot of people is just the idea of how to handle haters in 2023. Like I think a lot of brands will like try to pivot and listen to everyone, but sometimes they just get lost on like what the true vision of the brand is and what the product is because you can't make everyone happy and being able to figure out like what is your approach to like dealing with hate it can't always be like overly apologetic or pandering or whatever and i think for us just kind of given the nature of the brand like we've been able to use hate in a way that still is at the service of the brand and pushing it forward All right, this is a big moment for D2C Podcast. Today, we are tempting fate with Hamid Saifi, SVP Digital Retail at Liquid Death Mountain Water, one of the fastest growing CPG brands in history. Hamid is one of the first ever team members at Liquid Death, so he's been along for the whole ride starting in 2017 to today, where Liquid Death is in 70,000 retail doors and last year earned a valuation of $700 million selling water in cans. It's crazy, but what Liquid Death understands better than anyone is that while they may sell water, still carbonated and now tea, their real asset is customers' attention. So this podcast goes deep with Mead on Liquid Death's mindset about doing things differently and using every customer touchpoint as a moment to make them laugh in the face of death. From calling their review section opinions from internet randos to charging your soul to join their mailing list to the significant revenue merch program they've created where they've moved customized vending machines and wrapped Lamborghinis. Hamid gets to the bottom of what it's like to work at an organization that has achieved unbelievable velocity and massive cultural saturation. Slinging water in cans, the dream is alive, so let's dive into death. On with the show. Is 2023 the year you launch the merch store for your brand? If you're looking for a new revenue line and a way to increase brand loyalty and LTV, you might want to consider it, especially when there's players out there like Printful that make it easy to build your brand's line of merch without any of the operational headaches of inventory management or stock forecasting. Printful's product options run the gamut from socks to hoodies to home decor and everything super high quality with printing options that will look amazing with your brand's design on it. If you've got merch on the mind in 2023, think Printful and go to printful.com slash enterprise to start creating today. Hamid, thank you so much for coming on the D2C podcast. A uh, huge, obvious fan of the brand. And you've been there since the beginning, right? Yeah, I've been with the brand since, uh, since 2019. Um, we officially started selling cases of Liquid Death in January of 2019 as we were trying to figure out, you know, our D2C presence and Amazon. And then we took a little bit of a break as we figured out, you know, operational stuff. Um, I think early on, as you can imagine, I don't think we had any idea of like the success that the brand would have and how it would connect with people like so like quickly. And so we, uh, you know, ran through MOQs pretty fast in our first run and had to figure out the next wave. And then I started with the brand a couple of months after we sold our first case. So, yeah, it used to be like three or four of us in a small room together in Santa Monica. And now we have well over 160 people across the country. Unbelievable. What what was it in your fir- in your MVP or that first case? What were the key things that just made people love it? Um, you know, I think it's like for a lot of brands, you know, they lead with all these product and RTBs and reasons why people love the product. And it's for us, like we're selling commodity, which is water. And for the first 18 months of the business, we were only selling one skew, which is our still water, which is the white can. Um, so that's kind of a hero skew. And we only sold that for 18 months. I think what really resonated with people early on, was just like, here was this brand that was very like anti-marketing and spoke to people in a way that just felt like very real and entertainment led. Um, And we always take the approach of, you know, trying to sound like just like a human as much as possible. And so the kind of creatives that we did in the campaign videos that we launched very early on were things that you would never see from any other water brand or maybe even like an energy drink brand. So we were just trying to take a very fun approach to the content around it. But then I think the thing that just really made it take off is just the controversial nature of just the product name. We've got growth baked into almost every single aspect of this brand, from the creative and to the content to the name itself, 
to the packaging and the design when you're on shelf you're like what the hell is this like why is an energy drink or a beer brand what are they doing in the water section so it's like everything is intended to make you stop and just be curious so i think you know invoking curiosity was kind of the big part of Early you came days, out of the gate like out. that. You came out of the gate pretty fully. Like obviously, you've added on a lot, a lot more uh, engaging and and delightful and humorous elements. But you came out of the gate largely like you are now. Yeah, I mean that's the thing with us is, you know, Mike, who's our CEO and you know creative visionary behind the brand. Him and I worked together in advertising before, and we have a history of working with like really big brands where ideas go from incredible ideas to like watered down ideas um, really quickly as people get their hands on them. And for, you know, Mike and the team, as we brought people on, the whole thing around this brand is like, even as we get bigger, we're still going to be who we are. And even when people ask us questions like, how are you guys going to diversify and get into this audience? We probably already have a bit of that audience, but we never really change like who we are as a brand fundamentally just to get into new spaces. Like, oh, we want to try to win moms. Let's like do a mom creative. Like we don't typically do stuff like that. Like we're still at the core of it funny. And then we do a thing that's funny that, you know, shows people from different walks of life, like our Super Bowl spot, um, you know, had a mom in it who was pregnant and drinking liquid death and kids kind of partying around. You think they're drinking beer, but they're drinking liquid death. So it's like we do things like that to kind of get into these spaces without necessarily like pandering to different audiences. Did you guys know Rihanna was going to be pregnant? So you got that good double hit with your ad. <laughs> yeah, well, if only we could. Uh, we could also be Rihanna's baby. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Well, talk to me just just because you brought it up. Talk to me about the Super Bowl ad. What like talk to me about uh, like how that impacted your role in the company and and how the impact has been. Yeah, I mean, I think um, for a lot of brands, like Super Bowl is sometimes seen as like this like silver bullet to just get you insane visibility, traction, sales, and all the above. For us, like, you know, being a brand that at that point was about three years old and, you know, the fastest growing beverage brand of all time, we were just really trying to get to a place where, like, we just improved our national profile. And even though now we're in 70,000 retail locations and growing and digital continues to grow for us and we're, you know, have a lot of um, coverage and, and awareness from, like, media and press, um, for majority of people in the country, like they don't really know who Liquid Death is just yet. And, you know, we compete in premium water, and so for us, like the Super Bowl was like, hey, how do we just like raise the visibility of of the company? And the Super Bowl, like obviously with that captive of an audience, is the best place to do that. And our creative was, you know, very controversial, and I think we probably had one of the best spots, and we got mentioned on a couple of lists after the Super Bowl. But you know, like most things, Liquid Death early on. It's it's a polarizing thing early, right? Like half people love it, half people don't love it. And that's been the way it's been with Liquid Death since the beginning for anyone that's new. And we always just hone into this idea that, you know, if if everyone loves you, then you're probably not pushing it enough or you're not really pushing boundaries or being a little bit controversial enough. And for us, it's like we know we get hate. Um, it always comes. We got a little bit of hate, but it had a nice boom for our business. Like we saw retail velocities grow as a result of it. We saw obviously impact on our website and our Amazon business. More and more people kind of within network and partners that we talked to were like, oh yeah, you guys did a Super Bowl spot. So it's kind of like in many cases like podcasts where podcast does have a direct ROI correlation for a lot of brands, but for some brands, it's more about just kind of the 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 halo that you get from being on a Rogan or being on a Brilliant Idiots or being on other podcasts. So that's what we saw with Super Bowl um, last year. And it's also just, it's not obviously a no brainer, but for a brand like yours that has so much brand equity, it's going to have, a it, you're more likely to have a really positive impact when you're already building on a huge amount of brand equity that you guys have built up. Yeah. And I think that's a struggle with like many CPG brands. It's like trying to figure digital first or retail first or trying to figure both out. With CPG, it's like, you know, the key to success is trying to be at every single location that you can within a one or two block radius of people. So just raising national profiles as we increase like our retail distribution, it was just a definite no brainer to to take a stab at the Super Bowl. And then beyond that, it's you, you know, you have that other factor, which is a left hook product or a product where you've gone into a commoditized space and you've just reinvented it in a little way. Can you talk a little bit about how that fits into the overall company strategy? Yeah, if, you know, it's it's generally how we approach everything from product down to the communications. It's 
we look at almost like every single thing that's been done because we're very much like an anti-marketing approach to everything and try to put our unique spin on things. So, um, you know, I'll speak at conferences and talk to a lot of people and they see create, they see the liquid death creative engine in the machine, but they don't always see like what's going on behind the trenches that moved, you know, our digital sales to where they need it to be or Amazon to where they need it to be. Because like that stuff generally, as you know, is like not the sexy stuff that press is going to cover. But we took like even the most like quote unquote best practices. And I hate that term things that people do on the D to C side and we liquid deathified them. So like reviews, you know, most companies institute reviews using an Okendo or a Yapo, whoever it is. And they'll generally see, you know, 10 to 15% lift in conversion rate just because reviews matter. But for us, we're like, okay, cool. We have water, but like, what could people possibly say or how could they review water outside of like Amazon's very structured way of getting reviews? And so for our website, when we launch reviews, you know, we call them opinions, unbiased opinions from internet randos, right? And then we had these attributes that were like, how likely are you, do you, are you to, you know, be confused as, as an alcoholic or how good does this clothing feel against your skin? Like that, you know, so we just did kind of crazy different ways of even just doing like quote unquote best practices. And so that's permeated in our creative and how we roll out things on the communication side. And, and each one is a touch point that engages people in a way they're not used to be engaging. So each one of yeah. those is that opportunity to subvert someone's expectations in a way that connects you deeper to the brand and gives you their, more of their attention. Dude, the, and we're just in an attention economy and it's like the world is just so boring. And as you know, like most D2C brands – like God bless them, but they're really boring brands. Like they've just taken on a playbook. And for us, it's like any moment that we can communicate with the customer that just feels like your best friend sent this to you is like, that's a win. So, you know, we get asked this all the time, oh, what's your Black Friday strategy? And like, we generally are not a promo brand. We don't do big sales. But like sometimes when we do offers for things that bring people together, like 4th of July and Memorial Day and Labor Day, like all these like social events, like we just tell people like in an email, plain text, like, you know, go buy liquid death, uh, go fucking crazy. Like a very simple thing. So it's like for a lot of people like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. Our emails like are not super dressed up and overly designed. You know, people don't expect that. The way that we roll out certain campaign videos, just like stock art and stock videos and photos. Your like, mailing list is yeah. selling your soul. The mailing list is selling <laughs> your soul. Yeah. So we – um you know, yeah, just to touch on that since we're here now, yeah, we probably the one of the biggest things that we did to push this brand forward, even when we were just, you know, 75% an e-com business was creating this club called Country Club where you sign your soul to us for eternity. And as part of joining Country Club, you get a free case of liquid death on your first case order. Pretty good and, deal. And yeah, it was like, you know, how do we get email addresses and phone numbers and like, Oh, we're going to give people like 10% off. Like that's boring. Like what else can we do? And so it was a really cool idea that just kind of morphed because as you signed your soul, you got a copy of your contract that you could share on social. And then as you shared that on social, people were like, damn, like what Eric, you signed your soul to a beverage company for what? And it started just to take off. So now we have well over like 250,000 people that are part of this country club that we're doing different things with, whether it's digitally or like at Live Nation events when we do physical pop-ups for the uh, country club. But it only works when you build up all those connections with people and th have them think of you as, as a best friend or as their really funny-ass friend. How, how, where does the humor come from? Do you hire comedians? Are you all just, are you all just incentivized to be funny in your jobs? Like how, how, where does the humor come from? Yeah, so it's kind of a mixture. I mean, I, you know, we use agencies sometimes to kind of like get ideas started, but – there isn't necessarily like an idea that just goes from an agency and then gets approved and out the door. Everything is a collaboration. So we almost, the way we think about ideas here is almost like, you know, a writer's room for like a late night comedy show where everyone's just coming with the best stuff that they have. And then we just kind of distill it down to figuring out like, what's the idea that we go out with. Um, and most things start off with like, what's the stupidest thing and the dumbest thing that we can make. And then why would anyone care about it? And we start from that place and we start then attaching like brand objectives to it and ultimately getting to a place where like we have a really killer kind of disruptive idea, but it's also doing the service of pushing the brand forward. 
Um, but our creative team, incredibly funny. The agencies that we part with are incredibly funny. Like as you can imagine, we look for creative partners or new hires. Like you have to have some pretty wicked and insane kind of creative chops, but also just like comedic chops. So like think of the world in a kind of very different, almost like sometimes like a very fucked up way to, to ultimately start from like the edges and then whittle down to something that would make sense to put out the door. I just think about your rant or uh, non-biased opinions from internet randos. There's like, that's a four or five word phrase. There's three jokes in it. Right. There's sort of like, oh, it's, um, oh yeah, sure. It's unbiased. Great. Oh, we're internet randos. Right. Like it just, everything is just dense with, with meaning and little in jokes that draw you in. And then it also helps that the style is like a style that every, everyone, I, like, I don't wear a lot of skulls. Like I don't, I don't, I don't have that in my, but like everyone looks cool when they wear that kind of stuff. Right. And so you've got that going and your merch is like, talk a little bit about the merch strategy. I can imagine, like, I bet a lot of people sold their souls for a t-shirt with that cool ass logo on them. Yeah, the the kind of evolution of merch was, you know, it was, um, we always knew that I think this brand was going to turn into kind of like an entertainment lifestyle kind of a brand. But when we first started selling merch, we just had 10 SKUs and it was nothing crazy. It was just like our logo, front, back hits, very simple. Um, and initially, the only way you could buy merch was you had to be a part of the country club to get access to it. So it was exclusive only. And then after like the first couple of months, I was like, let's just open this up to anyone because merch is just going to be like a nice incremental revenue stream for us. And it serves as like a new way to get people into the brand. And ultimately, like we just want people as like walking billboards for this brand. Yep. And, and so, extend their life with the brand too, probably, right? hundred percent. Yeah. Extend their life with the brand. Because at the end of the day, it's like, you know, we've become the water, the preferred water for a lot of people's households. Like that's all they drink at in the house. But then it's like, how else do we kind of connect with these people? It's like, let's figure out how do we get on their bodies? How do we get inside their homes? How do we get inside their cars and so forth? So it's been a kind of a multi-pronged strategy that way. So merch, it was like beginning, very basic, exclusive. We opened it up. We then allowed people to, instead of getting a 10% for a subscribe and save, we let them get a free t-shirt instead. Um, Because that's that's the value that we want to give is like giving people a thing that sticks with them and they're proud of and want to show off and become advocates of the brand. And I was really worried in the beginning that we would possibly like have a lot of people churn out, they get their t-shirt and then just dip. That didn't happen. We saw way better retention after we gave a t-shirt. Our subscription business kind of really blew up after that. And then merch now, we started adopting a couple of different philosophies around dropping merch like a streetwear brand would drop merch. So we would have a drop on Tuesday, we'd have a drop on Friday. Then we started doing preview days for country club members as an added incentive. And we started working with more like artists to come up with like designs that weren't in-house designs and other brands and thinking about really weird product categories that you wouldn't think of. Like we sold a $6,000 vending machine, you know, like we sold costumes of our thirst executioner, which is our mascot. So anything from apparel down to these really insane kind of weird product ca- categories we started thinking about and they all have done remarkably well so merch is a really fast growing part of our business and a really integral part of our business as we you know look towards like the next five ten years i love to give people ideas and my ultimate i'm a merch guy i love merch we work with printful they're sponsor of the podcast but my the merch i want to produce at the highest end is a four thousand dollar 20 pound four inch tungsten cube and i feel like i think that's what i can give to you guys because if you put that out there and you get like a cool logo that of liquid death logo on one of those things it's like it's like an anti-marketing thing it's like an anti it's like an anti-consumerist thing in a way right like oh you just have a cube but that would sit on someone's desk forever right i think that's like the challenge man with like merch especially for a lot of brands is like you can't just like find a cool thing and put your logo on it and that's like enough for some brands, it might be the, the legacy brands that are really built up and have history and legacy. But for most, it doesn't work. And so, you know, we have a good mix of like Liquid Death logos, but we have a lot of stuff where it's just more just design front and center um, and design led. And it, I think it really started like we were trying to sell a three hundred and eighty five thousand dollar wrapped Lamborghini Countach on our website. Um, we didn't have it. It was like if someone wanted to buy it cool, they could buy it and we'd figure it out. But that product just being on our merch store, we had over 10,000 people every month that would add that to the cart just to see if it was real. 
And then it's yeah. like, then we just hit them with like, you know, abandoned card messages that were funny. So yeah. yeah, it's just like anything that could run the gamut, but it goes beyond just like putting a logo on it. It's like, if it's dumb, what is the way that it's dumb, but it provides like some utility for being dumb? Yeah. Well, being astronomically heavy, exactly. like mind bogglingly heavy is yeah. the value. I, uh, this is something I'm, I'm going to harp on until I get. So if there's big tungsten, listen, come on in. We'll get you. We'll get yeah, you. You're like you're like the death. neutron star guy. If you buy, if you get like a little grain of a neutron star, it falls through the center of the Earth. But you want to do that with tungsten cubes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Is, 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 is it too much to ask? Exactly. I don't know. Um, talk to me about products. So you started with your with uh, Stillwater. You expanded into sparkling. How many SKUs are you at now? And where's the next big field for Liquid Death? Yeah. So for the first year and a half, it was just mountain water, still water in the white can. Um, and then we launched 18 months later, sparkling, just the unflavored sparkling that we did for another year and a half. So for the first, you know, almost like three years of the business, it was really just two SKUs. And then we last year released three new flavors of sparkling, um, all flavored and have agave inside. So a lime called severed lime mango, which is mango chainsaw and a berry flavor called berry it alive. Um, and then just recently a couple of weeks ago, we launched a new sparkling flavor called Convicted Melon, which is a watermelon, kind of spicy watermelon kind of a flavor. So that's out. So in terms of skew count, you know, we have a couple of different pack sizes, but generally about six different skews of water. And then over the next couple of, you know, weeks or so, we're going to be dabbling into a new category, which is going to be tea. So we're going to have tea is out there as well. So yeah, we're, you know, been always kind of very super focused on a methodical rollout of SKUs. As the brand got bigger, we didn't over invest or put ourselves in an operational headache. Um, so we were super focused with like just SKU rollout. Now we're in a good place where retailers are super excited about the SKUs that they're carrying and excited for more and new innovation. And that's going to drive, you know, more stuff coming up. But I think for, for now, for the foreseeable future, like we have a really good roster of of SKUs in the mix right now that we're going to just run with and make sure we just execute with, with like excellence on, and then we'll figure out what's next after that. I love the, I, I, I've always thought that ha, like half sweet beverages or low sweet beverages are, are, are another one of those green fields where it's like, I don't want to buy, you know, like I can't buy, I can't have my daughter drink a juice that has, you know, 30 grams of sugar in it or whatever. And so even just the thoughtfulness of your sweetened beverages using agave, which is, I guess, lower on the glycemic index, uh, how many grams of sugar are in one of those? I'm just curious. Uh, I believe there are three. That's crazy. Three grams of sugar. Yeah. But it has a, you know, it has a little bit of sweetness to it. And for yeah. like your example, like, yeah, for kids, even with like our regular water, you know, we do get a lot of inbound messages from like parents and moms just saying like, thanking us because their kids never drunk drink water more hydrated <laughs> i know yeah. yeah it's like it's like this is the only thing that will get them to drink water very cool and now into tea which is another one of those like like you're disrupting tetley you're disrupting all the you know the, the pinky up like it's another perfect storm for you i feel like going into that space yeah i think it's like um you know mike our ceo references like you know richard branson in his book which is like like the virgin example like going to a very still category and kind of shake it up. And we did that with water because water all kind of looked and sounded the same. And everyone was talking about pH and all this stuff and all the stuff that we <laughs> never talk about. Um, and with tea, it's kind of kind of the same thing that, you know, it's a category that's a little bit stale. You've got some big, big players in the space. Still going to be an uphill battle for us to kind of fight that fight. But at the end of the day, there hasn't been a lot that's been new in there. And also on top of it too, I don't think like People will sometimes expect liquid death to be hardcore and brutal and about energy drinks and like all that stuff. And I think no one probably would expect us to really get into tea, but I think it's a really ripe space for us to have some good success with. I may, I make a Christmas punch every year that has black tea in it and it's, and it's it comes across very classy, but it also is like Red Bull because there's black tea in it. And uh, so I, I'll send you the recipe. You can oh, make cool, man. Yeah, death. for sure. And we'll send you some tea when, we, when we're ready. Oh, dude, I'm excited. I really want to try this, uh, the convicted melon as well. Um, so just even kind of a boring question. You've been there, you know, you said employee number three, four, very early on. You're now SVP of digital retail, right? What, what does that mean? What, like, what does that mean at, at that stage of the company? What is, what is your purview exactly? Yeah, so 
kind of my third role at the company. So the first year and a half was, you know, VP of marketing and handling merch. The next kind of year and a half was focused on like e-com, which was everything from our site to paid acquisition to Amazon to everything to digital experience. And then now really building up this new practice around digital retail, which is Amazon delivery apps, retailer.coms, retailer media, um, and then also kind of being <clears throat> a conduit for bringing like the digital and the physical worlds together through like either omni-channel experiences or tools or process. Um, so, you know, kind of post iOS 14 for a lot of brands, paid social has kind of been cut out. So it's like, what's the next thing? And now like, I think retail media is kind of at this early stage of, of this, what could possibly be a really nice bull run for retail media investment over the next like five to seven years. So kind of leading that charge, everything from Instacart to Target.com, Walmart.com, et cetera. And so we've built that over the last like year or so, and I'm building up more of a team around that. So for like on Amazon, that means like we're a top three water brand now on Amazon. Um, you know, we were ranked 700 in grocery uh, at the beginning of last year. I think we ended last year around the top 30. We're competing against like Avion and Fiji, big legacy brands, and we're like top three with them. And so We've kind of really built a nice presence on Amazon, continues to grow. On Instacart, we were the number three top 75 fastest growing emerging brands on, on Instacart. So that's another thing, kind of a feather on the cap for the team. And then we're trying to figure out delivery, honestly, out now. Like we have good relationships with GoPuff and DoorDash and trying to figure out Uber. At the end of the day, it's like we just want to get liquid death in your hands, at your party, at your event as fast as possible. And really my team's job is to kind of help do that while still thinking about how does kind of my world intersect with the physical retail world and vice versa. And what does your team look like on that? So right now my team is growing. Like we're going to have five bodies under my team before I had about eight people under me kind of on the D to C e-com team. So five new bodies, um, some directors, some kind of managers. We, um, we have some light agency support on things. Um, but, Really, everything else is just kind of in-house. So I kind of sit in a very, I wouldn't say siloed, but it's like it's our own kind of entity and group. And then we have about 25 plus people within the marketing team. And then we have obviously a huge juggernaut of a sales department. What are you doing on Amazon to kind of keep the liquid death feel? I imagine you've done up some incredible A-plus content there. Yeah, I think um, like for us – for a lot of platforms, we do get rejections on content, as you can imagine. Um, we had a case when we first realized like how good TikTok, TikTok's algorithm and just like video discovery and recognition engine was, was we launched at 7-Eleven. It was like early stage 7-Eleven launch. We wanted to get it out there that we were at 7-Eleven. And we had um, our thirst executioner, which is like this mascot and the head is a liquid death can and the eyes are his nipples, and it looks like a big buff dude. We had him go inside of a 7-Eleven, and just for like maybe half of a second, there was a cigarette ad that was on the door of 7-Eleven as a sticker. And they recognized that that was a cigarette ad, and we got flagged. But on Amazon side, like we've kind of got into a nice groove where like we just make things funny through like product bullets um, or A-plus content. It's just light, but it's not as probably over the top as it would be if we were running like a campaign video or launching something organically for social. So we're, you know, we're kind of adhering to a lot of um, the guidance and ways to not get things flagged. But at the same time, if you look at a plus content, there's very subtle like humor in there. If you look at product bullet points for like our merchandise, there's some little subtle like parts of humor there. So everything has some comedic thing and it's just not so over the top. We try to really get out of the way and like, Let people see that we have almost 30,000 ratings and reviews, um, that it's positively reviewed and rated, that we have a good mix of products and really just kind of get out of the way to get people to purchase. So in your role, I don't know what kind of budgets you'd be looking at and how you're directly tied to ad spend. But say say we gave you $100,000 for use to kind of grow – and I guess you you know you've been in all these positions, so you could say it across the across the business, or you could focus on specifically within digital retail. How would you deploy the funds to to, to grow grow the biz? Yeah, I mean, I think I mean it depends on what stage the business is at, but like for us, for you guys, yeah, yeah. for us, I think like 
the thing that's probably had the biggest impact on revenue across the board in terms of dollar in to dollar out has been Amazon DSP. Um, it's fundamentally changed our business and how we look at Amazon. Um, Amazon is our number one retailer, as you can imagine. We have a vendor relationship with Amazon, which is a really, really amazing relationship. Um, but as we were, you know, doing things on Seller Central and buying sponsored products and search and all that stuff, like it takes you to a certain point, but then like building out an audience beyond that, the DSP has been really crucial at. So that would probably be the one space I would think about is like, how do you build an audience beyond just the Amazon.com kind of environment? And DSP has been really, really phenomenal for us. Um, and then on the other side, I think, you know, this is just, I think, table stakes at this point, but you know, how we think about TikTok is, you know, we don't generally produce our own content for TikTok. Like a lot of it is UGC. And if we see something working on UGC, it then become something that we use across the book a board. So we might put a little bit of boost behind it and spark it on TikTok. We might then take that same thing and then chop it up 10 different ways for paid social ads. We might then also use it for like email content. We might use it for influencer outreach. So we really at the end of the day, even at this size in Series D, we still really operate truly like a startup with how can we get as much stretch out of one piece of content or one thing as we can. So it's been kind of a mixture of that on the content side. And then, you know, money wise, like Amazon is definitely like our biggest channel in terms of where we put media dollars today. This back, back to DSP. I actually hadn't heard Amazon ads referred to as Amazon DSP. Have Amazon ads always been served through a demand side platform? Uh, not always. There's, there's kind of two ways of buying, right? So there's the search side of things, which is open to anyone who's on seller central. And then DSP side, then you have to work with Amazon, contact them. They have a managed service, or you you can work with an agency. It's just to really truly get the value of on the DSP side of things, you have to be at a certain spend level just for it to start making sense. And I think we just got to a point where like, okay, cool. We started just hitting a ceiling for how big I think we could get with our existing ad products and where just revenue was coming in every month. Um, and we were like, okay, cool. Let's try DSP. And just for context. Like we grew our Amazon business 4X last year versus the year prior. So a huge boom on the business across the board. One of the other things, I just see so many podcast hosts, so many popular podcast hosts drinking liquid death. Do you have a whole team who's responsible for getting the cans and hands of influential people? Dude, we've been really fortunate because it's not like one of those products where you have to convince someone to like, you know, try it or like even just bring it on camera. So early days, like our kind of approach to influencers is, you know, we don't do the whole, hey, let's collab. Here's a discount code. Go out there and make some, you know, dumb piece of content to post on your Instagram or your TikTok. We look for like creators who we really love what they're doing, who almost could just like even be employees at Liquid Death, honestly. Like they have a really good authentic following. They're like, they keep it real with their audience. And we generally always start with like, look, we're going to send you some product. If you like it, if you want to post about it, great, but we're not asking you to. Like, just let, let us know what you think. And that really is still the model now. Like, people just loved it. And when they got it, they just wanted to show it off in social because it just looked so insane. And it was a thing called Liquid Death. So we got a, a lot of organic momentum that way. And then after the first couple of months of the business, we, you know, Sticks Nielsen, who runs our lifestyle group, he's done a really good job of building out a team who is essentially like a category insider in, in, in their own space. So we have someone in skate, we have someone in snow, we have someone in music and hip hop and so forth. And their real their primary job is just to get products seated to all these different spaces and to not have to pay for things. And so sometimes podcast people, like we maybe, you know, pay for um, spots on podcasts and they might get product that way, but a lot of them are just fans of the brand and they're just putting it on video just because. You said you mentioned scratching the surface, and I guess that's you guys are like your growth is just astronomical. Like it, in in the last three years, you're into the hundreds of millions. Like how how big can Liquid Death get? Oh man, I think yeah, I, I don't even, I don't know. Like I I don't know. I think though we're still operating in a place where, you know, we're still a product company, right? Like we're still putting out water and merchandise and. There's a lot of like new areas for us to explore because we're really an entertainment kind of lifestyle brand now. So that means content, that means movies, that means 
albums. Netflix show, yeah. Netflix show. That means like all this stuff that I think we've kind of built the IP around being able to do more than just product. And so I think that is a very unlimited space for us. And we have dabbled, right? So, you know, all the hate comments that we used to get on social, we turned them into albums. So we made two albums and they were called The Greatest Hates. So the first album was, yeah, the first album was a metal album. The second album was a punk album. And all the lyrics are just hater comments. And we pressed vinyl copies of both. We put them out on Spotify. They're on Spotify right now if you want to listen to them. So that was music. And then with movies, we did a feature-length movie um, with the producers of this Idris Elba movie called uh, Concrete Cowboys. Uh, they're called Neighborhood Films. But we made a movie called Dead Till Death where, you know, this group of young adults goes out to go camping and they aren't recycling and they're just like throwing shit around. And then the liquid death cans are essentially possessed and come like hunt them down for not recycling. Um, about a 45 minute long movie, which we put out as well. So we're starting to, we started to like dip our toes in kind of the content and entertainment space beyond like our just general campaign stuff that we do. But I think that's so, so early on for us to figure out like what's next in that world. Kind of really unlimited potential, honestly, I think. I think so. Another product idea just came to me. You need a, like a small electrolyte replenishment beverage that you can call Hater's Tears. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, just drink those all day long, all the way to the bank. But dude, I think I mean, that's like an important thing for like a lot of people is just the idea of how to handle haters in 2023. Like I think a lot of brands will like try to pivot and listen to everyone, but sometimes they just get lost on like what the true vision of the brand is and what the product is. Cause you can't make everyone happy and being able to figure out like, what is your approach to like dealing with hate? It can't always be like overly apologetic or pandering or whatever. And I think for us, just kind of given the nature of the brand, like we've been able to use hate in a way that still is at the service of the brand and pushing it forward. You make people decide on the brand very early on. And that's something we talk about again and again with brand owners uh, and love or hate, you're getting attention and the universe doesn't always know the difference between love and hate. Attention's attention. And, and this is an attention economy and attention is your product, right? Attention. You, know, you guys sell, everyone drinks, everyone drinks water and everyone has attention. And, and that's what you guys are doing. And I love, and you haven't even like so many of the brands we talked to, like mini Katana, they're making so many YouTube videos, or I just did battle box where they, they had a Netflix show and they have this one creator. Like you guys haven't even scratched the potential of like, of, of the attention economy when it comes to deep content. Like you always create good, funny content. Every aspect of your brand is a co engaging content moment, but you're just scratching the surface at content still, which is exciting. Yeah. There's, there's like a little bit of, you know, and Mike put this really well once he was like, you, you know, we're kind of taking on a persona a little bit, like a, like a wrestler would, right. Where it is. Yeah. Yeah. There's something behind it, but there's Heel. also like this elusiveness and this mystery behind it. We're like, you don't want to know that a heel in wrestling is actually best friends with the guy he's like fighting that night, you know? Yeah. So for us, like that's the kind of approach that we take where it's like, it is a less is more kind of approach because we don't want to get to a place where we're just like overly saturated with stuff and, you know, good creative and stuff can come from like a, a, a comment that we leave on a post. to like a reply. Like it doesn't always have to be like all these things, but I think you're right. We have room for more of that stuff, but we have such a high bar for how we think about At this creative. point. It has yeah. to be like so perfect. Yeah. Yeah. You're not grassroots content filming and making sales right away. You have an internationally yeah. recognized brand. So yeah, the content you put out, it's got to be top level. Yep. Super exciting. Yep. What a challenge. I can't wait to stay in touch as this grows into a billion dollar brand and beyond. Are you are you active on the socials if people want to reach out? Are you on, are you a Twitter guy? Uh, I have a Twitter. I'm not really active. Probably more active on like LinkedIn, and I've just started like throwing some videos up on TikTok. So you can catch me there as well. Hamid, this is awesome. Thanks for coming on. No man, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, you can do that right now at directtoconsumer, all one word, dot co. I'm Eric Dick, and this has been the D2C Podcast. We'll see you next time.